This video will offer an analysis of Alpha Green Speech 2003 FRQ from the College Board. Now, special thanks to Julian, Gabby, Maggie, Chris, and Melanie for putting most of this together. Okay, here we go. So this is what the, what the text looks like. Here's the prompt, and here's the text. And this is some of the stuff that we're going to be doing throughout the video. We're going to be taking apart the text and explaining what the strategies are. So let's begin with a situation. Alpha Green delivers a speech in this time, 1861, first month of the Civil War. African Americans were not yet permitted to join the Union Army, but Green felt that they should strive to be admitted to the ranks and prepared to, them to enlist. So we're going to read the speech carefully, write an essay in which we analyze the methods that Green is using to persuade his fellow African Americans to join the Union forces. All right. Right before you get into the text, look at the prompt carefully and establish the situation. Well, since it is being delivered at a time of war, one uh, first month of the Civil War, the audience is most likely scared and hesitant. So he might keep that in mind as he is addressing his audience. Also, he thinks African Americans should prepare to, en to enlist. So there is a sense of patriotism that will permeate throughout the entire passage. Now, let's do a pass to the prompt. We're looking at the prompt again here from Alpha Green to Union Forces. And here are some things that we can notice. The purpose. The purpose, we can tell right away, is to persuade his fellow African Americans to join the Union Forces. I mean, that's the basic idea. That's what he wants. He wants to um, tap into their nationalism in order to get them to join. At least that's that's what we can anticipate. Now, the audience, we say, is African Americans in the North. And this is true, but this is also an audience of slaves and former slaves who have been mistreated, to say the least. So he And he himself was a former slave. So he will keep that in mind throughout the entire passage. At least that's something we can anticipate. The speaker, as I've already uh, mentioned, he's not only a supporter of the Union Army, he's an abolitionist and also a former slave. So these are things that we need to keep in mind, right, um, as we are reading the text. Now, the situation has already been established. It is the first month of the Civil War, but it is uh, nonetheless a time of war. So this is a very uncertain time. And what he's asking is a very big thing that he's asking people. Now let's look at the first section. I always like to divide the analysis of the text into section 1 and section 2. Section 1 is uh, from line 1 to about 22. Now, whatever's in yellow highlights the opportunities that can be fully obtained in the country, giving the audience a form of hope. He says, the love of country, of freedom, and of civil and religious toleration. Later on, he hints at the racism in this section against African Americans and that they face in the country, right? And he hints at it also by inspiring us that even if uh, they have been wronged, we they should still love their country enough to fight for it, right? And he makes concessions, which is a follow-up to this hint. He makes concessions about how they've been mistreated, right? It is true that they failed to bring us into a recognition as citizens. It is true that our injuries are great, fugitive slave law, he mentions the Dred Scott decisions. So he makes concessions that help disarm the audience criticisms or the audience's, I don't want to say criticism, but I want to say the audience's um, well-deserved uh, problems with, the, with joining the, an army to fight for a nation that does not represent them. So that, that is understanding, but he, he, must under, he must anticipate those things and he must recognize them. And there is a patriotic tone here by appealing to a, a shared history, a shared history of the nation. Because he's, he says, our fathers sworn subscribed by the immortal Washington of the revolution. Right? It's our fathers, the deeds of our fathers. Now, let's break down section 1 and 2 from lines 1 through 22 into the first uh, part, which is lines 1 through 8. Notice a diction here. There's patriotic diction, I said. So the time has arrived. Give evidence to the world of bravery and patriotism. Love of country. My country, right or wrong, I love thee still. The diction is very patriotic. That's something you could analyze as you are writing your essay. Now, let's look at the metaphor present here, right? Uh, a raisin whose hearts burn the love. This expression is interesting because it's about the collectiveness of the human race. This is a race not only as in the African-American, the black race, but rather a race of us all. As a race, as a people, we love our country. And this is really interesting because it blends, it blends an issue of, 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 of segregation that is happening here, right? Now, 
Uh, as we continue, there's also nationalistic feelings present all throughout. These grand principles enable enable men to to say so. Like there, there are certain principles, there are certain values that are calling out to us in this time of need and war. And if we continue in lines nine through twenty-two, we can see that this anaphora repeated of it is true, which carried over from before, right? Carried over from before. Um, this anaphora repeated of, of it is true creates a a a, a paralleled concession and admission, right? Almost like a pitiful admission that this is true. This is our history, right? But in but he doesn't he only does that so that he can look at our past and then propel us to our future. That's the point, right? This is where we are, this is what they've done to us. So we need to move forward. And what would what would one of the options be? Well join the war efforts, right? So he acknowledges the unfairness. They failed to bring us into the recognition, fugitive slave law, slave laws. Um, they there are injuries that are great against us. This acknowledgement of the unfairness uh, makes the public feel like they've been understood. And this is important. It also sets up a call to action for later on, where he says, "We've been wronged, right? You don't like it, right? Let's join the war effort and change that." And it makes a friendly connection between between Green and his audience. Now, the last part, sympathy, aid, and the dangers and difficulties of those days that tried men's souls. Uh, the audience now is more prone and more open, I want to say, to hear the proposal, right? Because he's established, this is our history. We have not been recognized. But there's a kind of solution. So the first section almost works as a kind of problem. Well, an acknowledgement of the problem. And now the second section, there is a shift to the solution, let's call so this shift in tone is to to more urgent and demanding, right? And he says, let's not let's not just think about our past grievances. We're done with that. We need to move forward, right? We need to move forward. And he he almost immediately sets up a a, a powerful sentence that represents the higher calling, right? And this higher calling, there's a there's a sense of a call to action, right? We have to hope for the future and improve the present auspicious moment for creating anew our claims upon the justice and honor of the Republic. And above all, let not the honor and glory achieved by our fathers, which he brought up before, there was that personal connection before, be blasted or sullied by a want of heroism among their sons. And that's incredible, right? Because he says our fathers, like Washington and Jackson. This is huge. It's huge for the time period. There is an ethos appeal with a constant us and let us and our this. There is a sense of unity that is especially impactful and important here in these lines, 23 to 50. And there is a warrant or a reason given why we should enlist or why the African-Americans at the time should enlist. Remember, too, that you are a very presence among the troops of the North would inspire your oppressed brethren of the South with the zeal. If we join, we could inspire. So the first section, while it is a problem, the second section is about the solution. Now, let's do some of this to the entirety of the text. If we were writing the essay this year as opposed to typing it, I would say that this is probably one of the most crucial things that you can do uh, on the day of the exam, to engage with the text fully, to call out everything you see, and then later put it together, organize it into something cohesive and understanding. Now, let's look at the first part of section 2, lines 23 to 35, and then we'll do 36 to 50. So, there are parallel sentences here about past and future. Let us not be derelict to duty in the time of need, right? But let us endeavor for the hope for the future. So, this let us that you're pointing out as an anaphora, it's not just an anaphora, but it creates a repetition that is paralleled between past and present. A kind of like, let us move on from that and let us go to there, right? And his diction here in this section, his diction here is is uh, very much aware of the situation, very much calling out to action. There's a burning zeal and enthusiasm, inspiration, enjoyment, auspicious moment, honor and glory, right? There is the idea that we should be taking advantage of this opportunity, this moment right now. So when we continue in lines 36 to 50, the last portion of this second section, what we can see here is that the language continues, right? There's that emotional desire for freedom that he's tapping into. Take up the sword, trust in God who will defend the right. There's a lot of language here that's very emotive, 
right? But the interesting thing is that this portion, he sort of sandwiches between emotive language, pathos, and logical language. So there's take up the sword because we have to defend what is right, or rather God will defend who, he who is right, and we should fight for uh, freedom and drive back the advance uh, guard of civil and religious freedom, have more slave territory, build a stronger... So like there's a sense of um, there, he's aware, right? Those people who are saying that they're going to take more of our freedom, they're going to take, uh, create more slave territory. We need to fight those people, right? That's what this is. We need to fight those people. So there's a lot of emotive language, but <laughs> although there is emotive language, there's this moment at the end where there's a kind of logical appeal to something very reasonable, right? Which is, if you don't, if you don't want this whole thing about let us fight and let us, okay. But remember that if you were in the north and they would inspire the other people to overthrow the tyrant system and maybe join our war effort i mean that's a very logical moment and it's and it's very useful i believe in uh, amidst the barrage of these emotional moments and the metaphor of the war cry and the howling leaders of the secession is very interesting because it creates a contrast between principles right the principles of the north and the south right and the anaphora is still continuing to create that that, that war rally. Now, let's, for a second, as we finish the video, look at very quickly at a general list of rhetorical strategies and devices that are present here. So essentially what we did now, but instead of chronologically, we're only going to focus on the, on the devices as we go. So there is ethos, um, and you can stop here and uh, copy it down or whatever you want, but there is ethos uh, with a repetition of our and the relationship that it creates a, a shared community, a shared understanding of wronged and a shared understanding of what we, how we need to respond to this wrong. There is anaphora, the re and this repetition creates a paralleled idea of a concession, which it is true that we've been wronged, but it, it is also true that we owe it to the nation to do something about that, right? And then there's another anaphora later on, which is let us, let us. So the two anaphoras, if you were going to write about them, that you could look at the concession and then the admonition right now those biblical allusions which he makes a lot of but these are important because they're not just tapping into because people believed in god back then which is what most students end up writing in their essays but um the idea here is that what we're looking at is this biblical illusion is important because this is about a personal belief and for the people in this time for these people here this personal belief is very important the belief that we are doing something right because of a higher calling, a higher power, right? There's also historical allusions uh, to to our great fathers and whatnot. And maybe a connection that you can make between the historical and the biblical allusions is that they are references to, to higher entities, right? Or higher callings. And I think that's how they're, two, they're, they're both related. An awareness of diction might be a good idea here. Because the awareness of diction here... Um, the diction varies, varies from the acknowledgement of the of the injustices and the injuries to the hopefulness of the future. So this all adds up to the tone, and the tone is very much about urgency. The time has arrived, there is bravery, love of country, freedom. We need to do it for the great republic. Now, that's it. Uh, one of my students put this here. It's phenomenal. All right. Thank you so much. That's it.